get the uh, apostle here to Harvard, we were just going to max him out. That's the plan, is to max him out. I don't know where all of the uh, members of Koinonia and all of the, I think um, I listened to a sermon where you said, don't be a follower, be a disciple, you know? Um, so all the followers and disciples, um, we are going to maybe hold him here um, at Harvard. We, we might have to do that. We might have to do that. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, Apostle Selman is in the U.S. today. His ministry, his ministry um, he is the founder and the CEO of Eternity Network International that attracts thousands of worshippers every, every week, both in Kaduna and in Abuja. And on the internet, he blows it up every week. Though through his teachings, Apostle Sermon emphasizes the importance of personal growth, obedience to God's word and the pursuit of intimacy with God. He also focuses on addressing societal is issues. Uh, Apostle Selman's influence extends beyond religious circles. He's often sought after for guidance and practical um, um, mentorship by political leaders, entrepreneurs, individuals seeking spiritual enlightenment. Overall, his commitment to spreading the message of faith combined with his unique ability to connect with diverse audiences has uh, put him in places that you, wouldn't, you would least expect. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, here in Harvard, so you're going to make, make sure we do this very well, <laughs> going to speak very shortly about the role of religion in a resilient society lessons from Africa's development journey is the one and only very distinguished Apostle Joshua Selman. Please make him feel very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, greetings. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Please be seated. Please be seated. I'm honored to be here and um, to be delivering this lecture. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Joshua Selman, and uh, I lead a faith-based organization that is involved with matters of faith and spirituality, leadership, and human capital development, also involved in matters that have to do with national transformation. And so I'm going to be teaching very shortly my lecture is on the role of faith and religious identification in the socioeconomic development of Africa. By the way, thank you so much for the invite. Thank you, Prof and your team. Truly honored to be here once again. The objective, this lecture examines the historical background and the influence of faith, spirituality, and religious identification on the African continent, focusing on its socioeconomic contributions with a view to determining if faith and spirituality still holds relevance in today's world, particularly the contemporary Sub-Saharan Africa. The discussion seeks to highlight ways in which faith and religion has positively impacted and shaped the moral and socioeconomic fabric of Africa as a continent. For this lecture, the role of Christianity as a faith practice will be the case study in most instances, and as such, will have greater emphasis through the discourse. Introduction. From time immemorial, man has demonstrated, and please let me ask that you lend me your attention. This, I think, is a very thought-provoking perspective, and I plead that we follow together. Man has demonstrated an inherent passion, drive, desire for connection and relationships. Man has increasingly sought to connect to his fellow man and to connect with his immediate environment. Man has furthermore sought to understand his world and to connect meaning and purpose to everything around him. In his unending pursuit, he has not failed to test, try, explore, and deploy any and every strategy possible to find answers 
to questions about life, questions about meaning, questions about destiny, and so on. Spirituality, religion, and matters of faith in all its ramifications seem to have successfully proposed answers to these questions and to bring a resolve to man's confusion about himself and his world. Thus, the strong grip on faith, therefore, spirituality and religion has become to many, especially within the continent of Africa, what an anchor is to a sailor in the midst of a boisterous storm. Christianity in Africa, a historical background. The spread of Christianity in Africa is a historical process that has attracted a lot of scholarly attention. According to Shively, the introduction of Christianity in Africa began in the first half of the first century. The Apostle of Christ, Philip, paid a visit to the Ethiopian Enoch, and as a result of the visit, in addition to a series of events that followed, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was created in Ethiopia. Christianity continued to spread, and by 345, there were about 16 bishoprics in existence in Africa. Traditional interpretations attribute the progression of Christian missions in Africa to the missionary projects in European countries like France and England. According to this scholarly view, the birth of Christianity in Africa is credited to the colonial missionary activities of the imperial powers on the African continent. French missionaries concentrated on the West Africa with specific focus on countries like Senegal and Mali. And by 1839, almost the whole population of Senegal had converted to Christianity at the pressure of the French government. The English missionary movement was focused in South Africa, where the Missionaries Journey Society, uh, the Missionaries Society of England, my apologies, had begun to work in 1818. However, recent historical researches have challenged this religious and presumably Eurocentric views of the history of Christianity in Africa. Scholars like Robert Cash have examined evidences available and have agreed to the existence of Christianity and Christian practices in ancient Africa, especially the existence of the Christian Nubian kingdoms in modern Sudan, and have concluded that early missionary activities were not the basis for the birth and even the progression of Christianity in Africa. Instead, these works have shown that the process of Christianization in Africa was indeed indigenous, and African church fathers or leaders played significant roles in the development of Christianity in Africa. Great scholars like Dr. Kwame Bediako, the director of the Akrofi Cristela Memorial Center for Missiological Research, has argued in his works that the African church and the African practices has an old history and that history has its roots in the first century of the Christian era through which the African church has gone through different stages of development and changes. Generally speaking, through the lens of organized history, Christianity arrived in North Africa in the first or early second century AD. The Christian communities in North Africa were among the earliest in the world. Legend has it that Christianity was brought from Jerusalem to Alexandria on the Egyptian coast by Mark one of the four evangelists in 60 AD. This was around the same time or possibly before Christianity spread to Northern Europe. Once in North Africa, Christianity spread slowly west from Alexandria and east to Ethiopia. True North Africa, Christianity was embraced as a religion of descent against the expanding Roman Empire. In the 4th century AD, the Ethiopian king Ezana made Christianity the kingdom's official religion. In 312, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion 
of the royal the roman empire in the 17th century christianity retreated under the advancement of islam history tells us but it remained the chosen religion of the utopian empire and persisted in pockets of north africa by the 15th century christianity came to sub-saharan africa with the arrival of the portuguese in the south of the continent the dutch laid the foundation for and founded the dutch reformed church in 1652. in the interior of the continent most people continue to practice their own religion undisturbed until the 19th century at that time christian mission programs to africa increased driven by the anti-slavery crusade and the interest of europeans in colonizing africa however where people had already converted to islam christianity as a practice had little success christianity grew from then and through the years that would follow to become an agent of great change in africa it destabilized the then status quo bringing new opportunities to some and undermining the power of others with the christian missions came education literacy and hope for the disadvantaged among other benefits now i want to talk more particularly about the role and the influence of faith in africa's development when looking at the past and the present through the years faith and religion have been seen to be forces of both good and evil contributing significantly to the socio-economic development of africa but sadly and i say this with sadness leading to many other negative issues across the continent nonetheless let's consider the role of christianity as a case study in the development of the african continent these considerations will be made against the backdrop of four factors number one educational advancement second health care three economic empowerment and finally promotion of peace and religious tolerance education and literacy programs many faith-based organizations of african descent have been increasingly active in the area of education and secular enlightenment in addition to their core spiritual activities various churches and faith-based organizations have been involved in educational initiatives such as the building of schools colleges the awards of scholarships to both deserving and undeserving individuals all over the continent nigeria as a case study is a religiously diverse country's home to some between 200 and 400 um, different ethno-linguistic tribes predominantly made of christians muslims and then many who are of the trado african practices except for the southwest in nigeria which has a large population of christians muslims and indigenous african religions the southern regions are predominantly Christians. Now I'm looking at Nigeria as a case study. Islam is widely practiced by the Hausa Fulani in the northern areas, being the dominant faith practice, whereas Christianity is practiced by numerous minority ethnic groups in the same region. This diversity can also be found in higher institutions of learning, as religious organizations control many private institutions christian groups own the most well known and prestigious private educational institutions in nigeria extending to the continent of africa among these institutions using the universities as a case study are the affair babalola university the babcock university which is owned by the seventh day adventist church covenant and landmark university owned by the living faith church the bowen university which is owned by the nigerian baptist convention redeemer university owned by the redeemed christian church of god the joseph ayo babalola university which is owned by the christ apostolic church 
Other faith-based universities include the Crawford University, which is owned by the Apostolic Faith Missions. Uh, and then the Mountaintop University, owned by the Mountain of Fire and Miracle Ministries. Madonna University, owned by the Catholic Church. And um, last in this list, the Ajayi Crowder University, which is owned by the Anglican Communion. These are among many other educational institutions and have altogether contributed immensely to the growth and the development of Nigeria and by extension, Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa through their various programs. The church has always seen education as a critical cornerstone in the process of eradicating poverty and ignorance. And thus, it has not only initiated the establishment of educational facilities, but has also come up with measures to reach the unreached and the needy in the various places where illiteracy and poverty is rampant. Most of the faith-based schools are found in remote areas where the government has not been able to establish schools. These church schools are aimed at ensuring that the most marginalized people have access to quality and affordable education. The church has established various levels of educational facilities in different countries to aid learning and drive the campaign for literacy, especially in rural Africa. The educated population that has gone through these church-founded institutions have been and remain instrumental in the whole process of Africa's economic development. How true. Our second thought, healthcare and social services. According to a World Health Organization report, you may want to listen to this, about 60% of healthcare delivery in Africa is orchestrated by the church and or faith-based platforms. This is substantial in the backdrop of the fact that public health provision is hampered by weak governance, management flaws, and limited financing. In general, African governments allocate arguably less than 10% of their budgets to healthcare, and as such, the health sector is characterized by a short supply of health workers depleted and dysfunctional health systems, limited availability of essential drugs, and poor health infrastructures. I come from the northern part of Nigeria, and I can tell you that these are not just um, theoretical statements. Um, it's unfortunate when you get to some of these areas in Nigeria for a case study, I've traveled quite extensively across the African continent and I've been met with very, um, very disappointing expressions of pain and, you know, health issues, even across many supposedly cosmopolitan cities. Healthcare in Africa still remains a very serious issue, even among the organized African societies. In this difficult and challenging setting, church health services have dominated the provision of health care across the continent. Apart from missionary health facilities, the church has continued to play an invaluable role in offering preventive and curative medical services, particularly the local communities. The church has made significant contributions towards the primary health care program, such as provision of basic packages of health services to rural and underserved communities, assisting communities to develop and implement locally relevant and sustainable health programs, and ensuring access to health services for the most vulnerable and marginalized groups. The church health services have put more emphasis uh, on the most rural and isolated communities where no other health care provider exists. In remote and poor localities which do not have roads or good road networks and where people have to walk sometimes, and you believe this, for more than a day 
to reach the nearest hospital available. The church has maintained services that would easily have been abandoned by the state. This has not only served to bridge the gap in healthcare delivery, but also demonstrated the church's strong presence in uplifting the standard of such communities. The third area of focus in examining Africa's role is the area of economic empowerment. And particularly, I'm looking at entrepreneurship, job creation, and social aid. The church has increasingly engaged in Africa's economic and social development by providing various supports and value-adding economic empowerment services for the well-being of the African people. For example, the church has been involved in giving both spiritual support and material contribution to the poor, the needy, and the less privileged within their churches and communities. I can tell you that myself and our organization have been actively involved in this wise. We've launched various programs. There currently is an agricultural empowerment program and we've spent millions and millions of Naira just putting together um, professionals along that line to help train and empower people. This came as a response to the harsh economic reality that is plaguing Africa, that includes Nigeria, even though the largest nation within the African continent. The church has been actively involved in collaborating with private organizations and governmental institutions to help create jobs, give professional career trainings and workshops, set up entrepreneurship and business programs to as many individuals and local communities at large. Many churches have been at the back of the rise of many startups and SMEs with a view to promoting economic empowerment within their regions and extending same across the entire continent. Our fourth area of consideration peace and religious tolerance hmm. I took a deep breath because this is quite an interesting one religion has been a force of both good and ill in the stability of the African countries this is a fact in several destabilizing conflicts conventional or low level faith and religion have served as important undertones and sometimes as the outright basis for conflict and wars. Examples of these factors um, or examples of these kinds of incidences uh, are for a case study, the Boko Haram insurgency in northern Nigeria. This has largely been driven by extremist views and then you may want to consider the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda that was formed in 1987 by Joseph Kony with the aim of overthrowing the Ugandan government of Yoweri Museveni and establishing a Christian theocratic state. In several other conflicts, religion has been an undertone, even if not a formal basis of conflict in Nigeria again for instance the conflict between the Fulani headsmen many of you have heard this or probably followed the trend um, through the lens of media the conflict between the Fulani headsmen and the farmers in the Middle Belt regions are often understood as fueled by land scarcity grazing rights and climatic change but the truth is that they have a very strong religious undertone. The herdsmen are usually men of extremist views and practices, and the farmland communities they displace as part of the land grabbing program sometimes and most times are usually occupied or belong to Christian communities. This has been proven without any sense of prejudices biases or sentiments in many regards the law enforcement agencies on apprehending many of these um, 
this extremist herdsmen most of them have been found to be people who sustain extremist views and their victims have usually been people of uh, the Christian faith but religion has also been a force for peace and peace building in Africa contributing to possibilities for development in Mozambique for a case study which experienced a 16-year civil war between Renamo and the Frelimo forces that left 1 million people dead and ended in 1992. Mozambique's churches played a decisive mediation role that ended the war. Interfaith religious groups have also played strong roles in peace building, in civil conflicts, in nations like Cote d'Ivoire and the Central African Republic. The church and many other religious bodies have played significant roles in the release and the freedom of many victims of kidnap and abductions. As we have in many parts of Nigeria, including, um, you know, the Middle Belt and so on and so forth. In fact, extending to all the African nations. I remember one time I returned from a meeting and I was met with a very serious distress call. And on responding, I was told that um, the abductors had taken some people that were affiliated to me. It was a group of people who had returned from a program and all of them were abducted and they were given 24 hours to present 50 million naira, else every one of them will be slaughtered. And because they were closely related to me, we mobilized, you know, to inform the law enforcement agents, but clearly there seemed to be only so much they could do and sadly we had to get people even of other faiths to be able to talk perhaps with the um, abductors if they could show kindness and mercy and you would not believe the cruelty that came cruel statements from those conversations sadly one was shot on the foot usually those levels of mayhem are unleashed to get you to see that they are serious. To cut the long story short, we ended up spending up to 20 million naira, uh, even in the presence of law enforcement agents. Thankfully, they were all released and we had the opportunity. You see, the challenge is when these people are released, they still are not fine. The trauma that they have to go through, some of them go through rape, some of them go through all kinds of traumatizing things and it's one thing to get them free then begin a process of constructive rehabilitation because some of them even without the activity of terrorists again they may end up dying the trauma becomes too much you see and so uh, i'm not just saying this as a lecture these are realities that some of us have been forced to live with especially when you become a leader within these regions you cannot shy away from being part of the process that leads to some of these things and so I'm just using that to point that the church has played very significant roles on this wise furthermore the church has played significant roles in resolving ethnic and religious clashes in many parts of Africa and in fact have become partners with government and law enforcement agents in the promotion of peace, tolerance, and mutual respect. Religious bodies have actively organized peace concerts. Our organization has done that too as a case study. And so uh, my work started largely in Zaria for those of you who are familiar with Nigeria. And um, for many years we experienced all kinds of religious crises and so we came up with an initiative to hold periodic peace concerts and the intent is not to advocate fanatism i'll be talking a bit about that before i conclude my discourse and we successfully brought people from all religions taking away all kinds of prejudices and promoting love and you wouldn't believe how productive these concerts were people came um, we had all kinds of welfare activities and people, Christians, Muslims, and any other person in between, they came and it was very productive. I can tell you today that I have very good friends that cut across the religious divides. Very productive discussions. We may not agree on the core matters of faith, but I do not think it's been enough reason to 
hate to fight and so on and so forth are we together okay so um religious bodies have actively organized peace concerts interfaith forums sport activities and public discussions in many parts of nigeria and sub-saharan africa with a view to bridging the gap of intolerance and promoting peace and mutual respect challenges and criticisms like every and any other system led and managed by humans there will always be limitations compromises excesses and ill practices faith spirituality and religion has had its share of the aforementioned challenges this has led to criticisms from various quarters and strong reservations as to the overall relevance and practice of faith in our contemporary society today there is still a lot of growth and improvement truly that needs to be brought to the current context of faith and spirituality particularly in sub-saharan africa matters of neocolonialism by the religious and political elites advocacy of laziness and irresponsibility through wrong and extremist teachings lack of transparency and accountability in leadership even christian leadership moral failures within faith-based systems are all issues that whether now or in the future i presume will have to be confronted if the relevance of faith in nation building and social and economic development is to be preserved my concluding thoughts it is very clear that faith and spirituality still hold great significance in shaping the african continent as far as its future and destiny is concerned but it is also very clear and sadly so that africa's current approach to the practice of faith spirituality and religion still falls short of its potential of becoming an active force for change growth and development i think it was two years ago i had the opportunity to have a very brief discussion with um, the head of politics at the abuja u.s embassy and one of the subjects that we spoke about was um, the idea of the kinds of teachings that have come particularly from people of faith within the Nigerian context and the African context. And I did observe that from a psychological standpoint and from a standpoint of transformation and leadership, people become victims of the orientations that come to them. And because Africa is a very religious continent, uh, most of the ill ill information have come from the pulpit or various religious platforms sadly so even if from well-intentioned people and so i'm saying that it is very clear that our current context of the practice of faith and spirituality will need a lot of reconsiderations across many factors there will need to be great improvements in the way and manner that faith and spirituality is taught and practiced in Africa. There will have to be a growing orientation that transits faith, spirituality and religion from a mere advocacy of fanatism, blind loyalty and extremism or a practice that dissociates itself from societal transformation and nation building to one that will in greater measures spearhead the campaign for moral excellence honor to all men productivity and responsibility leadership development and so on we must introduce superior policies that stimulate great growth and development 
while preserving the fundamental human rights of all and sundry. This way, faith and religion will remain potent forces of change, socioeconomic development, and will become active contributors to the building of a better, vibrant, prosperous Africa, and by extension, the world at large. I hope that these thoughts that I've shared with us have helped us to really see that in the midst of all the conflicts that surround faith, spirituality, and religion, that from the lens of history and from the factors that I've put before you, I think it is safe to say that faith still holds value and relevance in our contemporary society, especially sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless.